As you have no doubt seen from the discussion board, there are a huge number of variables that could contribute to variations when recording sprint times. Wind is one variable that can have a considerable effect on times. A tailwind of up to 2 meters per second is the maximum permissible limit for a world record time to stand. The difference between no wind and 2 meters per second wind assistance could amount to a 0.1 second reduction in time over the 100 meters race. Does this mean that the record times that involve the maximum wind assistance allowed may be partially due to the wind's contribution and not the athlete alone? Usain Bolt's 2012 record of 9.76 seconds in the 100m race had a tailwind of 1.8 meters per second. One year later, he ran 9.77 seconds into a 1.3 meters per second headwind. A question to ask is, how accurate is the wind reading taken at an athletics venue? Currently, a single wind gauge is set up beside the track to measure the direction and speed of the wind. A fairer method would be to use several wind gauges on each side of the 100 meter track. Instantaneous wind measurements could then be recorded as each runner passed each gauge. Roofs of modern stadiums are now designed to maximise track speeds by minimising wind on the track. What happens when several factors combine? The 1968 Mexico Olympics were held at high altitude and the lower air pressure was calculated to be the equivalent to a 1.5 meters per second wind assist. In the final of the 100 meters men's, there was an actual 1.6 meters per second tailwind on top of the 1.5 meters per second assist due to altitude, giving an overall advantage equivalent to a 3.1 meters per second tailwind. Jim Hines ultimately won the 100 meters men's final in 1968 with a time of 9.95 seconds. His winning time, like many in the Mexico Olympics, stood for 15 years. It's hard to gauge how much altitude and wind assistance contributed to this fantastic time. But this does reinforce that when looking at a single data point, we should question everything. Another variable worth considering is the use of starting blocks in the race. Prior to 1948, starting blocks were not used in the Olympics. How might this affect the data points from this time onwards? Presumably starting blocks would have had a marked effect on how quickly the athlete achieved top speed. Before we can analyse the effects of the starting blocks, we should discuss how we propel ourselves forward. To propel yourself forward, you are applying a force to the ground. The ground in turn provides an equal and opposite force on you. This force causes you to accelerate and is a classic example of Newton's third law. Prior to 1948, athletes used all sorts of starting styles. In fact, before the modern day synthetic running surface was used, tracks were made from cinders or clay and athletes were allowed to dig their own launching pad in the ground. Starting blocks allow the runner to use his or her full thrust and not be reliant upon the friction between the spikes and the track, which could vary depending on the track material and the launching pad. Overall, there are a large number of variables that could affect the speed of a runner. Some variables, like starting blocks and a track, have changed during the period of the recorded data. It's important to be aware that any predictions about future records may not take into account these variables.